thank thanks again for chatting with me, John. How how is it up there? Well. Brendan, uh, first of all, it's good to uh, talk to you again. I can't see you, of course. We're on a one-way, but um, uh, it's, it's pretty fabulous, actually. It's, it's a lot more than I expected. We had a great ride up off the Cape, as you probably saw. Um, you know, the Dragon and the Falcon 9 performed very, very well, and we got here, and now we're in, in the good hands of uh, Expedition 69 uh, on the ISS, working, working every day. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, John, I was at the Cape for your launch. Um, it was probably one of the loudest um, launches I've heard of a Falcon 9 um, since I've been covering space. How was it like riding atop that that rocket? Give us give us some insight into what that ride uphill was like. Yeah, for sure. You know, it was uh, something I had been anticipating for a long, long time, as you know. Um, it was very interesting. It was it was completely different than I imagined. I don't know. Of course, you never know what to imagine if you've never ridden on a rocket, right? So, uh, it was a very slow at T minus zero. It was just a very slow rumble, and then we just began to lift. We could tell we were lifting, and then the um, the sound and the pressure built, and the rumbling got a little bit louder. And as we went through different stagings, uh, they became progressively a little little bumpier with each stage but it was a beautiful ride the resonance through the whole machine was just fabulous so often getting kicked off in the space about eight minutes later was pretty fascinating so yeah it was a good ride wonderful ride good job spacex and and was it what you expected john i know you we talked about you speaking with some some astronauts before launch obviously your commander uh has quite a bit of experience uh was it everything you expected it um yes it was every bit and more i think you know it uh, you, you 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 cannot truly imagine what it's like uh you can only suspect certain things but yeah it was it exceeded my anticipation uh it was fabulous you know peggy uh, my commander peggy whitson um she's been to space many times but it's also her first flight on a falcon 9 too so we all had a, an amazing trip together it was wonderful and when you get, did get into orbit and, and you saw the gravity indicator start floating, what was that experience like knowing that you made it to space? Ah, uh, well, <laughs> it was, you know, that, that was exciting. There was, a, there was a lot of cheering, you know, in the Dragon capsule at that moment. Uh, we all realized that we were in space. And from all of our training, we knew that all the, you know, to that point, all the big events were behind us. We were actually in space. And uh, and then our attention went to the next set of things, things which were enjoying being in space. Number one, uh, we were there. It was it was it was fabulous. Um, we remain in the restraints for just a few moments, uh, and then we proceed quickly to uh, once the dragon sorts itself out and gets the nose cone open. Then we're free to doff suits and get in normal clothes. And faces went straight to the window. Then, of course, Brendan, as you might imagine. And yeah, and, and tell me a bit about that, John, because I know we talked a bit about the overview effect before you left on, on this mission. Mm -hmm. uh, what was it like seeing the Earth from that perspective for the first time? Uh, it, was, it was a pretty wow moment, the first time that you realize that you're actually looking at the, we can't see the entire sphere, you know, at that particular moment. You can see maybe three-eighths or nearly half of it. It's beautiful. It's just this dark, dark black background with this nice, brilliant, shiny ball in front of you, white and blue, blue from the ocean, um, and the curve with the with the hazy outline of the atmosphere. And it's just so amazing how thin our atmosphere truly is. It's just amazing that you have the Earth, then you have this thin wisp of a layer of atmosphere that protects us. That's there. Um, once you grasp that, you, you're you're in a different environment mentally. That, wow, I'm actually in space. So it, it takes a few realizations to actually come to grips with that. Mm -hmm. John, a, a focus, a large focus of your mission is outreach and inspiring young people down here on Earth. Can you kind of fill us in on on what you've been doing so far uh, during this mission to to 
inspire the next generation of explorers like yourself. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I, I think that's a job that all of us have really is to, um, is to promote the advancement of the people behind us and their ideas uh, and the students today. And, you know, they're the ones that are going to build on what we've built now. So they're the future. You know, we always say that they are our future, but they truly are. And they will only be as good as we help them become uh, we, in our encouragement. So, so far I've had uh, several uh, direct classroom engagements, just like this one that we're on right now uh, in several countries. I can hear the children and the students cheer and scream and then clap in the background. It's certainly amazing as I share my stories like I have with you. Um, I've had um, gee, a, a number of contacts. You had a couple of ham contacts earlier, amateur radio with some uh, a, a classroom student. Actually, entire school system was online with me yesterday. Uh, and that was good. We've had a big, big uh, turnout on an art contest. I'm sure you've heard about. Yeah. Can you tell me a bit about about the art? What was what was the pieces that that won? And and did the did the rest of the crew participate? Did they get a chance to kind of look at the artwork as well that you brought up there? Uh, yeah, for sure. Uh, well, we when when I was ten years old, I painted a picture of astronaut Ed White in America's first spacewalk. And just because I fell out of the space, it was the biggest thing going for us in the 60s, right? So it was truly amazing. Uh, so I had that picture forever, and that's what brought me to space, really, was my you know, childhood dream of space. So as I began approaching this mission, I, I began to think about other 10-year-olds that were there just like me that may have the same dream, and I wondered what they were thinking and how we could ask them to express their feelings about what they think of space. So we asked a broad question. Um, what would it look like when we lived in space? Uh, we, we went out to five to 18 year olds in three groups, three age groups, and we, they can draw an art, a picture, picture of something in any media of art they wanted, or they could write some poetry. Some, some children don't like to write or draw and they would prefer to express in, uh, in words, which I think is beautiful. You know, you can bring a good set of emotions and feeling from that. So we got over 900 responses from 26 countries, uh, and it was truly outstanding. And the art was was incredible. I have a couple of examples here to show you if you'd like to see them. I would love that, John. Could you share that with me? That'd be great. Of course, I thought you might ask. Um, in no particular order, these are just some examples that uh, that popped out, which which were were good in my view. These are. Uh, and this is actually a way I can demonstrate that I'm in actually microgravity, Brendan. Let me get sorted out here so I don't throw stuff all over the place. You tend to lose stuff up here. That's one of the surprising things I learned about being in, in orbit is you turn around and that thing you had in your hand is no longer there. Um, but anyway, I have a very nice picture here and another one here. Let me help control those a little bit. We got air circulation here that tends to move things around. But look at this, Brendan. This is just some amazing imagery. And these are in the minds of our young people today. What does it look like to live in space? Um, it was astounding. We nine Out of 900 images, we just could not stop looking. It was that impressive. Those are beautiful. And and I've got to, I've got to assume that, I mean, I'm sitting here talking with you and this is this is mind boggling. It's super cool. But I've got to imagine if I'm one of those artists and I see my image floating through space with you, that has got to be such an inspiration. I mean, is that what you hope to get from this, that, that these students will be inspired to follow their art? Well, follow their dreams, follow what's in them. You know, we told them that we would bring some uh, chosen chosen uh, art pieces and poems. We have a couple poems here. This is some, some nice poems. These are really nice. We, we wanted to, it wasn't really a competition. It, it was, we wanted to select some really good art, but we don't want anyone to think that someone else's art is better than theirs, but we wanted them to express themselves so that we could see that is the dream truly alive? And we found that it was. So we want them to know that people are listening and will encourage them to do what they need to do to advance themselves. So we want primarily, I'm reaching to educators 
so that they will look at their children and listen for that voice that if someone expresses an interest in something, we should teach to that. And our school systems can moderate and improve to a level of teaching to the STEAM, where we put the A back in science, technology, engineering, and math, and understand that art is, a, is pure imagination when you do something. And just like technology and engineering, you have to imagine what you're building and imagine what you're inventing for it to come true. Mm -hmm. John, you, I know this was a focus of your mission. Has, has the way you approach this outreach and, and this inspiration changed now that you've actually been in orbit and been to the International Space Station and spent some time viewing the Earth from a different perspective? Yes, it has. Uh, it has. Uh, it has strengthened my resolve that uh, <clears throat> our need to advance STEM and STEAM education in the school systems has increased dramatically. Uh, this has shown me that children around the world uh, are impressed by space and what space may be. They already have their own ideas, uh, and they're driving themselves toward those. And when I was ten, and I was doing the same thing. Our school system was not equipped with STEAM or STEM teaching principles. It was just take your lessons and go on your way. So, you know, improving that today will will set us up dramatically here in the U.S. and any other countries to prepare our children to go to their future, their future, understand what they want, and then advance themselves toward that with everything they do. John, you mentioned you, you painted that photo or that picture of, of Ed White when you were 10 years old. What would you tell your 10-year-old your self now? <laughs> you think he would believe you that, that you're up there? <laughs> I would go back to him and I'd say, you are, you are absolutely right, John Schaffner. You know exactly what you want. So everything you do tomorrow, the next day, the next day should take you, you know, to that winning finish line that you, you know, so dearly want. Uh, and tell someone, ask your teacher about how do I do this? How can I do this? So raising the ability for students to solve problems, be curious about themselves, um, uh, ask questions. Just don't take what you're being taught. Take that and do well with that. You have to have good grades all around. But then if there is a, a burning desire in, in you to be something different and you're afraid to ask about it, get rid of that get rid of that just go and develop what you need to believe in yourself um, your teachers and your parents need to know what you want and then they'll help you so our, our school should be equipped to do that mm -hmm. john only if select amount of people can do what you're doing right now but your mission and and the work with axiom space is is changing the way we approach space and the democratization of space and the commercialization of space. What do you think your role is in, in this, these early moments of making space for all? <clears throat> I'm glad you asked that because, because I, I have not just a role here as a private astronaut to try to advance educators view of the teaching principles, but the help and helping to, by my being um, a participant here in early space flight, That'll, that helps build the bridge that we're trying to build to advance our uh, ability to get to low Earth orbit with commercialization and ordinary people and efforts. So the Axiom Station is building that will be built here in the next several years will provide a platform, the first commercial platform, that is to be a home for future development of going to space, giving us the ability to develop an economy in space and a platform that helps us go out and go further beyond Earth. So my participation here is to help build our understanding of how we take people to space on an ordinary basis. So I'm happy to be a participant in that for sure. And, and are you going to be having conversations with Axiom on your way back to talk about your training and, and your experience up there and, and how you can develop it for the next group of, of people that are going to be you know, taking this same journey? Oh, absolutely. You know, that's one of our roles here uh, as an Axiom private astronaut is to bring back uh, our opinions, our feelings, and our reflections on, on how this process has worked so that they can improve the process for all. 
And there'll be one of many, of course, that are developing methods of going to space and platforms in space, but it has to be done now, like the early days of, of aviation. You know, when it first started, it was quite expensive and it was hard to go, but as it opens out, uh, you know, it's it's an access for all. I think it'll take some years to do that, of course, but that's what's next for us. And that's where we belong, I believe. And will you advocate for Axiom to to continue this kind of outreach that you're doing? Would you like to have a, a, a classroom on on the, the next space station up there for for uh, for teachers to give instruction from orbit? Oh, I would for sure. You know, I like to I like to think that that might happen. But yes, I'm, I'm continuing <clears throat> to to beat the drum of STEM and STEAM in the schools. Axiom already has developed the beginnings of programs to do the same thing because they recognize, you know, through the same same way I do, that we have to have the the next generation come and take on the roles. Uh, there are lots of career paths available in aerospace and going to space. Not everyone has to be an astronaut. If you don't want to be, that's fine. But you you can do lots of things here, lots of exciting things, engineering development. Um, graphics, uh, tool sets. I mean, there are so many things that, that we need to develop the future of space access for us. So these are the early days. A lot of good things are happening. A lot of people are doing it. So I'm, I'm choosing to do my part. Mm -hmm. um, John, was there anything that was um, that you didn't feel prepared for or that took you by surprise when, when you got to the station? Are, are you able to adjust to microgravity? How's the food? <laughs> you know, give us a, a sense of, of what it's actually like to live up there. Well, well, the food is the best part. One of the best parts. Food is awesome. Uh, you know, anytime you can go to space and have scrambled eggs and sausage, right? Or teriyaki chicken, you name it. NASA has a great food kitchen and they, they we built a full menu. Uh, so that was an easy part. The hardest part up here I found was uh, learning to fly. You know, you see all these astronauts zipping around. That's actually pretty hard to do. Things take longer. You know, it took forever. I'll try to do something here. I'll... You know, that was that looks easy in the movies, but it's actually well, actually, actually this part is hard. This is a, a beginner's move. Um, but flying through the space station uh, is quite difficult. Um, you know, without bumping around and looking funny, but fortunately the crew here, <laughs> Expedition 69, are pretty patient people. <laughs> well, hey, uh, from somebody here on the ground, it looks like you're doing great. <laughs> Thank you. And, and so finally, John, we're, we got to wrap up this conversation, but um, I, I want to ask you, I'm assuming you're coming home um, and you're not planning to stow away up there, um, but when you do return, uh, what's next for, for John Schaffner? What are you going to do once you're back on Earth? Well, I'm going to look for my next ride to space, probably. But uh, in in the meantime, I'll, I have a lot planned. Um, uh, I formed a, a small foundation that will you know, advance some educational tool sets. We're doing a lot of filming up here of like to live in space, you know, showing to give a little tool set, a little two minute clip that educators can use in the classroom to supplement education to create talking points for children, showing uh, examples of physics of microgravity, uh, how you eat food, how astronauts, uh, what clothes do we wear, why, uh, some of the life sciences that goes on here, just the basic things so that a 10 year old can compare what they do on earth to what it's like in space to help their imagination kick off. So. I'm looking, I'm really excited about that. We, we've got a whole set of things that are very exciting that we should have out for the classrooms in the fall. It's totally free to the classrooms. We just want to show how exciting space truly is. Well, great, John. I can't wait to follow your journey when you're back here on Earth. Thank you so much for, for joining us and, and chatting to us from Low Earth Orbit. Brendan, pleasure to talk to you again. You know, keep your feet on the ground or come up here and keep your feet on the ceiling.